G'day guys, it's Dr. James Simcock here. I'm just doing a short video for our YouTube members. Um, just want to say a big uh, thank you to all of the new members that have joined up. Um, we are going to continue to produce some great content for you guys and um, stuff that we think is going to be useful for you in practice and some tips and tricks and, and really kind of practical stuff that you can use in your workplace straight away. So um, I've actually just been on leave for a couple of weeks, so um, that's why I haven't produced many videos over that time. Um, actually managed to get away up into the high country in Victoria and do some hiking, which is great. So this is a case that came in to see us today um, and it presented with a really uh, marked swelling on the distal radius. Um, and you can see this large soft tissue swelling and an associated bone reaction and change in here. And this was a 10 year old large breed, so 35 kilo uh, mixed breed dog. And this swelling had come up over about a month and the owner um, reports that a lameness had kind of progressed over that time and when the dog presented was, was significantly lame. So this is a case where on the lateral x-ray we can see a lot of um, kind of change in this metaphyseal bone. We can see some periosteal reaction, I'll bring that camera a bit closer, if it'll zoom in and focus for me, maybe not. Um, we can see some periosteal reaction there um, and these are the referring x-rays so I can't manipulate them too much. Um, but I'm quite concerned about the changes we can see in the bone here and also with this corresponding periosteal reaction and, and soft tissue change. And then on the AP view, um, the camera resolution is not the best. I'll just come back a little bit so you can see it better. We can see again, um, I've got the normal leg on this um, side here and we've got the abnormal leg here. So um, we can see this kind of moth-eaten, kind of lytic proliferative bone change here. And what I'm very concerned about in this case is, um, is an osteosarcoma. And osteosarcoma um, is the most common bone tumor that we see. Um, it has a metastatic rate of about 90%. So 90% of dogs will have this tumor actually spread to the lungs um, or to other bones by the time we actually diagnose it. So it is quite aggressive. And with these tumors, um, the reason I guess I wanted to bring this up and, and chat to you guys about it is just the decision making around whether or not to do a biopsy or not. And this question comes up a lot. Um, and what we typically say, and a lot of, a lot of surgical oncologists, oncologists will say, is that if we have a typical radiographic appearance of a lesion in a typical location, so distal radius is one of the common locations, um, remember away from the elbow and towards the knee, so proximal humerus, distal radius, proximal tibia, distal femur are the most common locations. So a typical looking lesion, a typical location, typical breed, so it's a large breed dog, typical age, this dog was 10, so anything greater than eight is, is a common um, age. Um, then those tumors are generally gonna be osteosarcoma until proven otherwise. And the interesting thing is that um, if it came back as any other kind of bone tumor, like a um, fibrosarcoma, primary bone tumor, I mean fibrosarcoma or maybe chondrosarcoma, that the prognosis would actually be a lot better if it was one of those tumors, okay? So if we um, compare those tumors in terms of their biology, the osteosarcomas have a metastatic rate of about 90% versus about 20, 25% for fibrosarcoma or chondrosarcoma. So in these cases, we don't often do a biopsy. And the reason for that is that about 25% of the time, if I was to use a biopsy, like a jam sheety bone punch, even if I used that bone punch and, and did the biopsy under fluoroscopic guidance, there's still about a 25% chance or a 20% chance that that um, histopathology sample will come back as just reactive bone, even when we take a sample from the center of the lesion. And so that then puts us in a tricky situation when we talk to the owners, we say, look, we think there's a tumor, we take a biopsy and there's no cancer on the pathology, it's very likely that we've just missed the, um, the representative section. So when I'm talking to these owners, I always talk to them about the possibility of a biopsy, but I don't push it that strongly. Um, I do give them the option um, however, so in this case, um, what we've talked about is the next step is to do a CT scan of the lungs to make sure there's no evidence of metastatic disease. And then pending those findings, um, what we've recommended as a treatment is actually an amputation. And so just to quickly review for you the treatment options in general, we have at the lowest end of kind of the aggressive spectrum, pain relief alone. So we could do pain relief only, and we'd expect a median survival time of around two to three months. Kind of next up in terms of aggressiveness would be palliative radiation therapy and we do actually do palliative radiation therapy at a hospital um, using ortho voltage or 300 kilovolt um, radiation therapy machine and what we see there is about 20 sorry 70 percent of dogs will have a response um, and um, the median survival time with those guys if we do chemotherapy on its own is around about four or five months maybe a bit more um, the next option is to do an amputation and that would be my recommendation 
Um, for instance, if this was my own dog and there was no other major orthopedic or neurologic disease, then there's absolutely no question I would take this dog's leg off. It is a big dog, but um, we do literally hundreds of large breed dog amputations commonly, and the outcomes are almost universally good. Um, even if there is some level of um, pre-existing neurologic disease or, or um, orthopedic disease in the other legs. And that's true of both the front leg and the back leg. They generally do really well. We kind of, and I always raise this with the owners, we joke with the owners that they're born with kind of three legs and a spare. So amputation on its own would give us a, a median survival time around about six months. And I think the interesting thing here is to recognize that if we combine either the palliative radiation therapy treatment with um, chemotherapy or with the amputation with chemotherapy, then can we actually double or sometimes triple the survival time? So if we do palliative radiation therapy and chemotherapy together, then the survival time we can get is often out around seven or eight months, sometimes up to 10 months, depending on the study. If we do um, a combination of surgery and amputation and chemotherapy together, then the survival time is somewhere around about 10 to 12 months. The chemotherapy that we typically recommend is carboplatin, um, and generally we're doing somewhere between two to four treatments every three to four weeks. Um, the final option that we have for this guy being that it's a distal radius is a limb salvage surgery and there's a whole bunch of different ways we can do a limb salvage and I'm not going to go into the details of that just now. Um, but in my experience um, and what's reported in the literature is about 50% of dogs having very major complications following limb salvage and that might mean either um, failure of the implants or the construct so the, the plates pulling off the bone or the bone breaking. Um, or potentially getting infected. And an infected limb spare is a really unpleasant thing to have to deal with. So I always have a very frank discussion with the owners about the option of limb spare versus amputation. And in most cases, and as I said in my own dog, there's really no question that I would do an amputation over limb spare um, in those situations. So hopefully that's been useful. Just a quick overview of osteosarcoma. Um, really happy to be back on deck now and, and filming some things for you. And um, if you have any feedback for us, certainly just reach out and let us know. Thanks guys.